Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg is being sponsored by On Q Marketing, Best Buy Benches, OmahaFastFoods.com, Certified Transmission, Omaha Magazine, Monahan Financial, Sholdit, NP Dodge Real Estate, Valpac, Coles Pharmacy, Centrus Federal Credit Union, Ideal Water. Welcome to Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg, the show that will leave you feeling great about yourself, Omaha's heroes, and Omaha, where we live, work, and play. So park yourself on the bench and have fun. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg. It's the show that you watch every Saturday to make sure that you get the information that you need to get yourself a better life. We do it four ways. We give you four motivational vignettes that are very, very important to you. I then introduce you to a public service organization that does some tremendous things for the city of Omaha that frankly don't get enough recognition. And this week, each and every one of us will have the pleasure to be introduced to my guest, Mr. Ian Garrett, who's going to be doing some great understandings with us and great conversations about the wonderful things that not only is he doing in Omaha, Nebraska, but he's also doing around the country. And this is something that each and every one of us can learn from. But first, I want to talk to you about some very, very important issues. Number one, how many of us watch the TV show called Flip This House? Now, you know exactly what that show's about. If you remember the opening, what people do is they drive by a house and it is absolutely dilapidated. You talk about curb appeal, there is none. You talk about going into a house, it looks absolutely terrible. Now, between you and I, what we would normally do with that house, we would absolutely drive by it and say, no, nah, this house is not for me. It's got too much work that needs to be done. It could never be repaired. It's always going to be that way. And you know what happens? That's exactly the way it remains. Until one individual says, I got a better idea. And that idea is as follows. We're going to go in. We're going to rebuild this house. We're going to take its foundation. We're going to add to it. We're going to make it better. We're going to increase the value of the house and the inside of the house. That's what they call flipping this house. Now, here's a question. And I want you to take this question very personal. What about you? When somebody drives by or sees you, or when you look in the mirror and see yourself, and you say to yourself, uh-oh, I'm a little bit dilapidated. My interior is not that good. I have no curb appeal. I have no value. You have a choice. You can stand there and look at yourself and say, this is the way I'm going to be the rest of my life. Or you can take a lesson from that show called Flip This House and just change the name and say, it's time for me to flip. It's time for me to make myself look better. It is time for me to get the insides, my head, my body in tune, my head and my body working together, my head and my body to become something positive so that next time people walk past me or the next time I look in the mirror, I get to say to myself, I flipped and I flipped upwards. And I gotta tell you something, I'm glad that I did. I want you to think about that. And then I want to tell you a story about Carol, my wife. She is absolutely obsessed with a game called Candy Crush. I think everybody knows what that game is. It's a wonderful game. I don't understand it. But like any other video games, it confuses me. Why? Because she plays to go to the next level. And she gets frustrated every time when she can't. And if Candy Crush is not the video game that you play, I'm sure there are many that you do. And your goal is to always get to the next level. But the interesting thing is, when you get to that next level, is it easier? Absolutely not. It becomes harder. Do you give up? Of course not. Do you want to pursue that very hardest level possible? Yes, you do. Why? Because you want to prove to yourself that you can actually overcome it. You want to prove to yourself that it gets easier. You want to prove to yourself that the harder things get, the better you are going to be. You know what I wish? I wish each and every one of us would look at our lives as we do Candy Crush or any other video game. Why? Because we always say to ourselves, when does life get easier? When is it that things are going to become much more simpler for me? When is it that all the difficulties, all the obstacles, everything that everybody throws at me is going to go away? 
Because when that doesn't happen, what do we do? We get frustrated. We give up. We get ourselves in a state of denial. The lesson that each and every one of us want to remember is Candy Crush or any other video game just like it. We pursue things that are more difficult. We love the achievement. We need to do today the same exact thing with our lives. We want to get up in the morning. We want to get through the day and say, come on, give it to me. There's nothing hard. I can take the challenge. I can overcome it. I can do it. Because every time you get to that next level, that great smile is going to be just as powerful, just as impactful as playing that video game. And that's where it becomes something to really remember. But in order for that to happen, you have to begin to say to yourself, there's an envelope. We've all heard the expression that says, you've got to go beyond the edge of the envelope. So I've got an exercise for you. It's a very, very simple one. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine that envelope, the envelope that you are going to go beyond the edge. Close your eyes right now. Take a second to think about it. Do you have that visualization in your mind? Because here's a question. What size is that envelope? I can almost guarantee you that that is a letter-sized envelope, or maybe one that you put an RSVP card in. And if it is, I'm going to help you out with something that you never even thought of before. Guarantee you. That envelope, why is it not a large manila envelope? You see, envelopes come in lots of sizes. They come in big sizes, not just small ones, not just medium-sized ones. And the way you visualize that envelope for the very first time, begins to determine in your mind what kind of a thinker are you? Are you a big thinker? Are you a huge thinker to begin with? Because even in that manila envelope that we described earlier, yes, you can go well beyond those edges. As a matter of fact, you will. The one thing you want to remember from this moment on, anytime somebody says to you, I want you to think about something, don't think small, don't think medium, think extremely large. Now, the other thing we want to talk about are dreams. There's a great expression that says each and every one of us should follow our dreams. Now, I want you to imagine that for just a moment. I want you to take your set of five dreams and I want you to begin to follow them. Now, think of that vis visualization because there's a problem with that. What's the problem? Those dreams are always in front of you. How are you ever going to catch up to them? The expression doesn't say catch your dreams. It says follow your dreams. It's a bad idea. Here's what I want you to do. Every time you have a dream, don't follow it. Don't catch up with it. Lead it. Get in front of those dreams. Take those dreams with you. Live them. Visualize them. Create them. Have them follow you. Because you're the leader, the dreams aren't. Because those dreams will always be elusive unless you are the one that is in the lead. Now what I want you to do is take those five dreams and I want you to visualize you in front of those. And then I want you to think about the three other things we just talked about. You are about to flip the house, which means you are about to flip yourself. You are playing Candy Crush as you are leading those dreams. You are wanting things that are more difficult. You know you can handle them. You know that you want to pursue them. And then as you look at those dreams, think of those big ones. Think of the big dreams that we just described, you described, in that envelope. When you put all these together, I know you're smiling, you're saying to yourself, hey, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you have an option. When this show is over, you can say to yourself, I learned a lot. What am I going to do with it? What action steps am I going to take as a result of these four very powerful, very common sense ways to take your life and get to where you want to go. You're in the lead. You're the one in control. You're the one playing the game of life. You're the one that has the large envelopes. So take those dreams, seal them in that big envelope, revisit them, and make sure that each and every one of them carry you to where you want to go. These are very simple. These are very idealistic. These are very general, and these are very, very simple things to do. So what you need to do is to basically close your eyes. Have a moment of silence with yourself. Do some meditation with yourself. And get yourself action-oriented. 
Find the most difficult thing there is for you to do and get a candy crush out of that. Find yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, now I'm going to reinvent. Now I'm going to change myself. Find that envelope. Throw it out if it's small. Throw it out if it's medium and make it very, very, very large. And the next time you have a dream, take those dreams. Absolutely lead them and bring them to where you know that they're supposed to be and have other people follow you and have them become part of what you want to do and have them become a part of everything that's going to be happening in your life. That's your assignment. When we come back next week, I want to hear about it because I'll be able to see you in that camera knowing how well you do. You know, each and every one of us right now have the opportunity to see this television program, and that's a wonderful thing. But I got to tell you something. There are lots of people in this world who can't see. And these are children right now who are in schools and they're unable to learn because they can't see very, very well. For that reason, there's an organization called the Nebraska Foundation for the Visually Impaired Children. They've been around for 49 years and their mission is to enhance the lifestyle and edu education of children who are blind or visually impaired. You know what they do? They provide them funds and advocating for the following things. They provide them with assistive technology, adoptive devices, and related services for the children's daily use. They give them cultural experiences for the children and their families. They give them training opportunities for educators and parents, and they do mentoring and support programs for the children, their families, and their educators. Their information is on the screen. Have fun looking at the TV show, and remember, you can be part of someone else's line of sight. Well, now I've got some terrific news for you because we are about to be joined by Mr. Ian Garrett. Now, he's going to tell you about what he does, why he does it, and who he exactly impacts and the beauty of helping others. Ian, welcome to the show. It's an I'm honor to be here, Andy. I'm so glad that you're here. So I want to get right to it. Tell me what you do and give it to me in a bit of a summary of what you do and how it impacts people. So my organization is called Infinite Day Institute. It's uh -huh. a L3C or a low profit limited liability company. Okay. It's one of 900 other organizations around the country that are essentially making maximum impact in social, uh, in, in the social field. Okay. Essentially what we do is we help individuals, organizations, and communities to maximize their full potential and develop into higher level organisms. And we do that specifically by focusing on non-cognitive development. So cognitive development focuses on grades, test scores, IQ. Right. Non-cognitive development focuses on intrinsic motivational skill sets such as persistence, foresight, character, humility, et cetera. Um, we do that through empowering communities such as um, through a urban agricultural project. Wow. Recently we worked in partner with Home Depot, the Nebraska Forest Service, and the Omaha Housing Authority in order to bring sustainable agriculture to impoverished communities. Also we've worked with different organizations where we customize curriculum using non-cognitive development for foster youth. Recently we worked with Project Everlast and the okay. Nebraska Children's and Families Collaborative and we worked with the pilot program, essentially having uh, 10, 10 foster youth. Right. And at the end of the five week program, all 10 of the foster youth were employed. So we're empowering people in ways that aren't necessarily being provided in different social sectors or in the educational institutions that are provided today. So my question is a very, very simple one. Why? <laughs> Why are you doing this? I mean, there's so many other things you could be doing. You're a bright individual. You've got a terrific background. Thank you. Why? I think it's, it's needed. Growing up in the educational system that we're in today, our educational system was essentially composed by John Amos Comenius. He was okay. a Czech in about the early 1600s. And what he did was he created the kindergarten through post-secondary educational system back then. Right. But what he did was he infused character as one of the main focuses and resiliency, right? And now in our current educational system, we took that and we created it and made it for an industrial-based economy. Okay. Now that we're going into the knowledge-based economy of the future, those same skill sets, the memorization, right. regurgitation, right. that's no longer applicable. So <laughs> yeah. now individuals need right. 
they need resiliency. They need to be right. able to navigate the chaotic and unpredictable environment that we're, that we're in today. You know, I laughed when you said memory and, and mathematics because the thing that came back to my mind was the famous multiplication tables. Exactly. <laughs> that we all went through, and I'm thinking how that was drilled into my head as something that had to be absolutely knowledge-based. And boy, I had a problem with that. So I, I wanna get in a little bit involved in technique. So if I was a third grader, and I had to do my multiplication tables, and I'm beginning to understand, although I don't know the words cognitive and non-cognitive, what could you do differently to help me, if there is something, to get through my math tables using the different techniques that you've just talked about? So instead of just having them do drills and not right. explaining to them the process of how they actually master the drills, okay. we focus on persistence. So doing things over and over again right. until you gain a mastery. Right. If you don't tell them that they're working on persistence, right. then it's a lot harder it. and it, it doesn't penetrate their psyche as much. So I think what you're saying is you help them work on the process instead of just the end game. Exactly. And if you understand the process, then the end game becomes a lot simpler. You know, we were talking about Candy Crush earlier, and Carol, my wife, always says to me, there's a process in this that gets me to the end game where most people just focus on when am I going to get there. Exactly. So in, in, in our educational system, we focus, like you said, just precisely on the outcomes. Right, you right. Know, we're outcome-based, but we don't really focus on the thought and the patterns of behavior right. that lead to those particular outcomes. Right. And if you share that information with people, I think that they're able to achieve and excel at a faster rate. So do you go into classrooms, do you go into schools, colleges? How do you take your program from a concept into the reality, and even more important than that, into people's lives? So we customize curriculum, okay. um, not only doing workshops, but we'll also go into institutions and we'll decide and work with those organizations to see what it is that they want. Right. Primarily what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll do short lectures, we'll do right. PowerPoint presentations, worksheet exercises, role plays. We also wow. have individuals wear our bracelets for different weeks, uh, for eight week period precisely. As reminders? As reminders, okay. as a constant reminder of what it is that they're working on. Like wow. this week I'm wearing Excellence, my Excellence bracelet. Okay. So it's a constant reminder and you wear it on your dominant wrist. Right. So you can see all throughout right. the week what it is that you're supposed to be working on. And additionally, we have our individuals that participate in our program, we have them do and, and write diaries. Right. And, and they also journal okay. in order to get that repetition right. and to make sure that they internalize the concepts. So how many bracelets are there? there? There's eight. Eight, which is where the name Infinite Eight comes from. Exactly. <laughs> and do you remember all eight? Can you tell yes. our viewers what all eight are? And give me a little, or give them a little bit of an explanation okay. as to why they're important and what they do. Okay, so self-discipline, right. we define as doing what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it, whether you feel like it or not. That's okay. the cornerstone of, of the eight. All right. Then it's self-responsibility. You have a responsibility to different individuals or organizations in your life. Right. So maximizing relationships. Okay. Persistence is self-explanatory. Right. Excellence, not only working on your strengths, but attacking your weaknesses as well. Okay. Then foresight is creating a mental wow. projection. Visions. Vision, visualizing what it is that you want to create in the universe. Sure. And then taking steps to make that tangible. Right. Then is character, so doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Okay. And then our last one is humility, which is essentially thinking about how valuable you are right. to the world, right. but then also seeing value in every person that you meet. Very interesting. So how did you come up with these eight? Is it something you developed? There's, I believe there's a couple of books that you wrote. Yes. And are these books about these cognitive skills that I would have to admit that most people don't have? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Essentially, I remember researching while I was coming up with a workshop design okay. for, for a pair of students. And I was researching and I came across people like Socrates, I came across people like Ben Franklin. And I remember Ben Franklin, he had 13 virtues, right? right. Um, one of them was humility. He said, imitate Jesus and Socrates. And as a result, he created a 13 week program okay. where he would carry around a piece of paper that said humility or really? industrialization. This goes back to Socrates? It goes back to Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin, I'm sorry. Exactly. Right. Yes. So, so this is an individual that only had two years of formal education. Wow. So he would carry this piece of paper around in his pocket for a week at a time right. to internalize the process. Right. So we said, why not make it 21st century? And why not take 13 and condense it to eight right. so that it goes along with a two-month schedule and they could replicate it up to six times a year. Wow. How long have you been doing this? We've been doing it for about a year and a half. About a year and a half. And about how many people have you impacted 
so far? What would you say? Over 2,500, we counted. That's fantastic. Exactly. Now, is that only here in Omaha or? No, recently we did a, a road show and right. we took the Infinite Eight around the country. We went to eight cities in eight days and wow. we visited different institutions. We were out on the street, right. interacting with the community, and we were able to find out what other organizations were doing around the country that were innovative, but at the same time, we were able to present what it is that we're doing as well. And let's talk a little bit about the books. What's the title of the books and, and what do they contain? What, what information are in those books? Um, my first book is Rebirth of a Dream. Okay. And essentially it chronicles my life. It's an autobiography. And essentially I was trying to compress what it is that I was able to do right. as an impoverished young black male growing up in North Omaha. Okay. How was I able to succeed and be able to get out of that situation? Um, and then secondarily, my second book is called The Immovable Race. Right. And that's essentially about a nonviolent revolution in America that's led by young people. Outstanding. So, and I can't measure your age. I'm trying. So, give me your age range. I'm 28. 28. So, 28 years old. I don't know very many authors at 28 years old who have successfully written an autobiography. To that point, I think it is absolutely amazing. Can you share a little bit what the book contains about your life, anything that you'd like to reveal that is published? Okay. Uh, primarily, my background is in mentoring. Okay. So at the age of 15, I became the national spokesperson for the National Mentoring Partnership. And because of I'm that- I'm sorry, whoa, I need to go back on that. At the age of 18? 15. 15, pardon me. At the age of 15, you were the national one, one spokesperson, spokesperson for the National Mentoring Partnership. How did you get that position? Essentially, I was in a mentoring program at Metropolitan Community College, right. and we went out to Alexandria, Virginia, the headquarters right. for the National Mentoring Partnership, and they said that our program was going to be shut down. So as a result of that, I spoke out against right. it, right. and because of the way that I spoke and the way that I was passionate about what was going on, right. I was able to gain an opportunity to speak in right. front of a larger audience That's in New fantastic. York. That's fantastic. That's right, and it's a lesson here. One of the reasons I bring these guests on, because I want everybody in the audience to realize that you don't have to wait until you're 93, like our previous guest, Elaine Jabanis, who did a lot in her life. You don't have to wait until you're 40 or you're 30. When you're 15 years old, you can attain national prominence and get the passion that you have in your life out there to impact others. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just found that so inspirational. Okay, let's move forward. Definitely. Then after that, I attended Howard University for, for undergrad. Right. And, and while I was there, I still was working with the National Mentoring Partnership. I was able to attend the, the Oprah show right. and to meet actors, Hill Harper. I was able to speak at the Lincoln Theater in Washington, D.C. Wow. I was also able to speak at the Library of Congress and Viacom in New York City. Right. So I was able to do a, a number of things. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to condense and show what it was that I did. For, right. for example, in high school, I had an estimated family contribution for financial aid of zero. Right. So my family could contribute zero. So as a result, I filled out 67 scholarships and wow. I ended up getting nine. So persistence. Wow. Sure, so sure. for example, the law of large numbers, if you right. shoot at a basket enough times, right. eventually it's going to go in. Yes, yes. So taking those concepts and allowing them and sharing them and distributing them to people who may not be able or have the intellectual capacity to read 100 books, right? right? We compressed that and then made it simple for other individuals to enjoy. Excellent, and that's all written in your autobiography. Yes, that's correct. So let's assume right now that you are about to write another book. And the book is a book about your future and where this program is going. Because <laughs> you talk about dreams, you talk yep. about visualization, you talk yep. about persistence, you're living it. Exactly. What's the future look like? Right now, we're actually getting ready to release our early childhood curriculum. So I didn't even know that. <laughs> exactly. And, and the curriculum essentially is in order to infiltrate the black market of daycares, uh -huh. in order to raise the standards right. for, for early childhood. Right. Nebraska, in particular, is a state that's lacking in that particular area. They did a report last year right. that said that Nebraska was 50th out of 50 states in early childhood quality. I remember reading that. Right. Yep. So as a result, we're attacking that, and our program deals and, and is in line exactly with the Infinite Eight principles. So they're Fantastic. practicing non-cognitive development right. from birth, yeah. you know, until until the fourth, yeah. until age four, to be exact. And they're also going to be doing meditation 
environmental wow. education. Yeah. Um, it, we're, we'll be making green daycares as, as a result of it. Unbelievable. So we're, we're doing a lot of things. So for the future, we're going online as well with our early childhood right. curriculum, which allows us to access yeah. not only the United States, but the world. So our goals and our, our long-term plans are, are to be international. Ian, I have to thank you. I don't know about everybody else in the studio, but all I know is this. I did not expect all that information to come out. So here's a question for you. What are you going to do about it? You have just learned about all these cognitive opportunities for you. It's time for you to take advantage of it. And I so much appreciate Ian being on this week's Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg. We have learned so much from you. And by the way, wait till you see next week's show. Next week's show, we're going to have an individual as powerful as Ian, who has taken their dream and impacted others. Because that's what Omaha is all about. That's what this show is all about. This show is here to make you feel good about yourself, about the people in Omaha, and all the great things and all the great opportunities. We've learned a lot this week. You've learned a lot about yourself. You've learned a lot about different ways to take your life to the better level, not even the highest level, to a better level. You've learned it from Ian, who's done some magnificent work at age 28 and started at the age of 15. The question is for you. What are you going to do when you get up from this couch? What are you going to do when you get up from the chair? Are you going to say, hey, that was a great program. I can't wait to come back next week. Or are you going to say to yourself, hey, I'm going to do something. Ian has just become my role model. I got some great ideas this week, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to pursue them. Because did you see the way he smiled when he said how much he impacted other people? That's the smile I want you to have. That's the high I want you to attain. That's the high that's in each and every one of us, right on the insides. And it's up to us to do what Ian has done. It's up to us to keep Omaha high. It's up to us to take our dreams, and you know what I'm going to say, it's up to us to lead our dreams. It's also up to us to do one other thing, and that is come back next week, Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. Either be live on the air and DVR it, but make sure that your Omaha High becomes the high of your life. Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg was sponsored by On Q Marketing, Best Buy Benches, OmahaFastFoods.com, Certified Transmission, Omaha Magazine, Monahan Financial, Shold It, NP Dodge Real Estate, Valpac, Coles Pharmacy, Centrus Federal Credit Union, Ideal Water.